This is section 8.2, the Pythagorean Theorem. We finally come to what is one of the most well-known and perhaps most useful theorems in all of mathematics, the Pythagorean Theorem, which is believed to have been proven by the Greek mathematician Pythagoras around the year 500 BC. It's been proven over and over again in, a, in over a hundred different ways. We're going to use one way to prove it here that builds off of what we did in section 8.1. So the theorem states, in a right triangle, you need to have a right triangle or this does not work, the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the legs. The hypotenuse in a right triangle, remember, is the longest side, the side that is opposite the right angle. So the square of the hypotenuse, when I take the length of the hypotenuse and I square it, I multiply it by itself, I get something that's equal to the sum of the squares of the two legs. It's normally written or seen in this form, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So you might recognize the Pythagorean theorem as that form. We, it only takes that form if we have a picture like the one I've drawn here, where the two legs are A and B, and the hypotenuse is C. Notice I use lowercase letters for the sides of the triangle, and capital letters for the angles of the triangle, the points of the triangle. And I used a lowercase letter that was opposite its corresponding capital letter. Lowercase a is opposite angle A. Lowercase b was opposite angle B. Lowercase c was opposite angle C. That's the con convention of how we write this. And doing it in that form gives us exactly this formula. a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So to prove the Pythagorean theorem, we just start with any old right triangle. And we prove that we can get that equation using the sides of that right triangle. So, here's the way we're going to prove it. First, I need to write this proof down in your notes. We're going to draw a perpendicular line from the point C to side AB. I'm going to draw a perpendicular line that goes from C to AB. That's called an altitude perpendicular line from a corner of a triangle to the other side. So I'm going to draw the altitude from C to AB. It'll look like the one I just drew, drew there in red. What allows me to just draw a perpendicular line like that? How do I know such a thing exists? Because we had a theorem way back at the beginning of the course that threw a point not on a line. There is exactly one line perpendicular to the given line. So if such a perpendicular line exists, if it exists, I can draw it. So that's my reason for why I'm able to draw it. Statement number two. So now I've got this perpendicular line. I have a situation like what we addressed in section 8.1, where you have an altitude in a right triangle from the right angle which means that we form three similar triangles. And the uh, pieces of the hypotenuse form a proportion with the two legs of the triangle, where each leg is the geometric mean between the whole hypotenuse and the segment of the hypotenuse that's adjacent to that leg. Or we can get those proportions from the three similar triangles that we have. So those proportions, and there's going to be two of them that we're going to work with, are C, the whole hypotenuse, to leg A equals A to what I'm going to call E. And E will be that right side of the hypotenuse. I'm going to call the left side D. So we get 
this proportion, c to a equals a to e. We need to get another proportion that I'm going to write together with this one, c to b, the hypotenuse to leg b, equals b to d. So the other way of saying this is that a is the geometric mean between the hypotenuse and its side of the hypotenuse. B is the geometric mean between the whole hypotenuse and its side of the hypotenuse. So the reason when you have an altitude from the right angle of a right triangle each leg is a geometric mean. Just kind of writing that in shorthand. Okay, now I've got two proportions, and I know anytime I have a proportion, I can cross multiply on those proportions. So that's all I'm going to do here. C times E equals A times A, but A times A is A squared. And the second proportion, I'm going to have c times d equals b times b, but b times b is b squared. What allows me to cross multiply in proportions, remember that is a property of proportions. Okay, now I'm going to add these two equations together. I'm going to take the left-hand side of each one, CE plus CD, add those together, and set that equal to the sum of the right-hand sides of each one, A squared plus B squared. What allows me to add two equations together like that? The addition property of equality, the addition POE. I'm going to scroll down and we'll lose our picture there, but I need more room. Okay, so c times e plus c times d equals a squared plus b squared. I'm going to factor out the c on the left-hand side. Which is really the distributive property in reverse. So the reason is just the distributive property. So I distribute the C back into the parentheses, I get CE plus CD. And then I'm going to notice that E plus D is C. E and D were two pieces of the hypotenuse. Together they make the whole hypotenuse, which is C. So since E plus D equals C, this is the same as c squared equals a squared plus b squared. I'll just make a note to myself so I remember why that is because c equals e plus d. So since I'm substituting c in for e plus d, this is the substitution property. And then I'm done. I've got equation of the Pythagorean theorem. c squared equals a squared plus b squared, or a squared plus b squared equals c squared. That's just one of, as I said, over a hundred different ways that you could prove the Pythagorean theorem. We're going to prove it in a different, more hands-on way in class. And the way we're going to prove it is going to require thinking about the Pythagorean theorem in a different way. And we're going to think about it the way that the ancient Greeks thought of it. And this is the way the ancient Greeks thought of it. The area of the square on the hypotenuse of a right triangle equals the sum of the areas of the squares on the legs. So instead of thinking algebraically of squaring the lengths of the hypotenuses, we're going to think geometrically of having a square and attaching it to each of the sides of the right triangle, where the sizes of those squares are simply the sizes of the sides of the right triangle. So this orange triangle I've written, drawn up here, uh, that triangle, orange square I've drawn up here, comes from the side of the right triangle, which is in blue, 
that had length A. So this was A, and I drew these so that they are all A. So that's A, and that's A, and that's A. Sorry, A. Similarly, the red triangle, the red square, sorry, was drawn so that all of the sides are the same as the side of the triangle that is B. And the gray square was drawn so that the sides of the square were all the same as the size of the side of the triangle of length C. So that's C, that's C, and that is C. So the way the Greeks thought of this was to think about taking the areas of those squares. So take this square, chop it up, and this square, and chop it up, and then fit them into this square. And show that those are exactly the same. That this area plus this area equals exactly this area. Which is kind of weird to think about it. Visually, if you look at it right now, it doesn't look like that would quite work. But in fact, it does. And we're going to see that two different ways in class tomorrow. Here are some examples of how we can use the Pythagorean theorem. If we have a right triangle, which in both of these cases we do because I've denoted that we have a right angle, then we can apply the Pythagorean theorem to find one of the sides of the triangle as long as we know something about the other two. So in problem number one here, I've got a right triangle where the two legs are 3 and 7 and the hypotenuse is x. So I can apply the Pythagorean theorem, which says 3 squared plus 7 squared equals x squared. How do I know it has to be written like that? Because the x needs to be by itself. The x is the hypotenuse. It's the longest side. It's the side opposite the right angle. So it needs to be by itself. And I usually write that on the right hand side. So then I can solve this. 3 squared is 9. 7 squared is 49. Then equals x squared. Well what is 9 plus 49? It's 58. So 58 is x squared. Okay, well I don't want to know what x squared is, I want to know what x is. So x, when we get rid of that squared around the x, is to take the square root of both sides. So x is the square root of 58. And that's perfectly fine for an answer, even though it has a square root in it. Because square root is still a number. It's just not a whole number, it's not an integer, but it's still a number. So x is the square root of 58. Is that square root simplified? We could check. Yes, it is. 9 doesn't go into 58. 16 doesn't go into 58. Neither does 25 or 36. So we're good. Now number 2. I've got to be careful about the way I write my equation. Because this time 10 is the hypotenuse. So I'm going to have 10 squared on the right hand side. I'm going to add up the legs squared on the left hand side. x squared plus x plus 2. That whole thing needs to be squared, so I need to write it in parentheses, just like that. Now, to solve this for x, I'm going to have to foil out this right and so this set of parentheses here. The x plus 2 squared is the same as x plus 2 times x plus 2. Not just, we cannot distribute the squared and, and make it x squared plus 4. We have to take x plus 2 times itself, because that's really what it means to square something. So when I FOIL that out, I get x squared plus 4x plus 4 equals, and 10 squared is 100, so I can go ahead and do that now. Now I've got x squared plus x squared. That is 2x squared. It's not x to the fourth. It's 2x squared. Then I've got a 4x and a 4 equals 100. Now I need to factor this, but before I do that, I can notice that all the coefficients are even numbers. I can divide a 2 out of everything to make the math easier for myself. And before I need to factor, before I factor, I need to bring the 100 over to the left-hand side. So let's divide everything by 2. x squared plus 2x plus 2 equals 50. Now let's subtract the 50 to the left-hand side. We only factor once we're equal to 0. 
So then we've got minus 48. And I'm going to get myself some more room. Okay, so x squared plus 2x minus 48 equals 0. Now I factor. I need to find two numbers that multiply together to give me 48, or negative 48. Add together to give me positive 2. So I think and think and think and... Hey, how about 8 and negative 6? 8 times negative 6 is negative 48. Good. And 8 plus negative 6 is positive 2. Perfect. So I put an x and I put an x and I put a plus 8 and a minus 6. Now I've factored it. I can always check my factoring by foiling that out and making sure I get back what I started with. So this means x plus 8 equals 0, or x minus 6 equals 0. So that means x equals negative 8, or x equals 6. That's weird. Can I have two answers? Ordinarily, no, I cannot have two answers. And if I think about this, x was the length of a side of the triangle. Lengths of triangles cannot be negative. So I can completely disregard that answer. X cannot be negative 8 because it makes no sense for the triangle to have a negative length on the side. So X must be 6. So keep in mind, note, lengths must be positive, not negative, and not zero. Here are your two immediate practice problems. These are just like the two examples I just did. All right? Find the value of x. Remember that the length of a segment must be positive. So if you end up with a negative answer, rule it out. You must draw the diagrams in your notes, or you will not receive full credit for these two problems. You must show your work. I do not want to see just the answer. So show your work and draw the pictures. Find x. And that is the end of section 8.2.